Quick Slants is presented by your local New England Honda dealers. I, I, I got a confession to make here. I am enjoying the Patrick Mahomes experience. Maybe I'm a little late, but I really think that he is transcendent. And, and, and not the Patrick Mahomes experience that is the brother and the wife and the State Farm ads, Travis and Taylor, and that sneaky, loathsome Kansas City fan base. But Mahomes, I like him. And it all crystallized for me last week when trying to analyze the game and decide who my pick for the winner would be. It came down to one team having the transcendent player. Mahomes is a thumb on the scale of competitive balance the same way Jordan or Gretzky or Montana or LeBron or Magic, Larry, and Brady were. For me, he's in that mix with those guys and the Tigers and the Tysons and the Sugar Ray Leonard's sneaky dominant. Seriously, sorry, I spent 20 years looking at the greatest to ever do it. And Mahomes still isn't halfway to what Brady did, but even if he has just less than half the resume, he's... More than half the player. When it comes to the best to do it that these eyes have seen, Mahomes is right there with Brady and Montana. Phil, Phil, Phil. It's Phil Perry. Hey, what do you think? I'm right there with you. And what makes Mahomes interesting relative to those two great quarterbacks that you just mentioned, Brady and Montana, Tom, it's his ability to make plays with his legs. What did we see at the end of the Super Bowl? Fourth and one with the game on the line. They put it in his hands and let mm -hmm. him scramble for yardage. What was the play that got them deep down into Niners territory in that overtime just a few plays later? It was a Patrick Mahomes scramble. He can make plays within the pocket that we know, but it's his ability to transcend from outside the pocket, off schedule, that makes him truly great. He has taken the goat baton and scurried further up the mountain with it, as goats will do. All right, it's time now for the game plan. Credit or blame? What are we giving out after this one? First things first, quarterback. That's Patriots related. Polls, comments, and we got more Mike Lombardi that you might not have seen because it's real good. We wanted to share it with you. But right now it's time for Quick Fire. It's presented by your local New England Honda dealers. Check this out. This is Kyle Shanahan's record in Super Bowls. Now, it's not what you're looking for, but he's been to three. He's been to three, 25-point lead, a 10-point lead, and a 10-point lead, all up in smoke. All right, Phil Perry, GOAT in terms of Patrick Mahomes dominating the game, or GOAT as in our guy Kyle Shanahan peeing down his leg? I'm going to lean more towards the Chiefs winning this game rather than the Niners losing it, Tom, though they did have a 10-point lead. They were the favorites coming into this game. They had kind of a historic offense over the course of the regular season. They should have been able to win this one, if not for a few plays. But when you're going up against Patrick Mahomes, it makes you do weird things. Like, for instance, I would have, I would have taken the ball second in overtime. Really? Because you have to know who you're playing against. In the regular season, going first, your defense is tired. I get the reasoning. You're going against Mahomes. Don't give him four downs. I think that gave the Chiefs an advantage. We're going to revisit that conversation, but I want to just throw this stat at you. It's Mahomes. It's not Kyle Shanahan. It's Mahomes. It's Mahomes. He was six for seven on conversions in the fourth quarter and in, in overtime. There was a run by Isaiah Pacheco, but that's a handoff. On either third or fourth down, six for seven down the stretch in that game, and they were singularly outstanding plays. Meanwhile, undercover keys to this game. Check this out. Check out the dots. This is the Trent McDuffie blitz on a third and four with two minutes left. Watch that blitz. Number 22. And if you watch it again, he sneaks underneath of just a well-timed blitz. Steve Spagnuolo was, as we talked about, Phil, perhaps the most important coach going into this game. So forget about Shanahan. Forget about Reed. That was an unbelievably well-disguised blitz, and there was nothing that Brock Purdy could do because the little fella was invisible until he was right in his kisser. Well, and he tends to get a little bit invisible, Tom, when the pocket closes down on him. This is unfortunately just something that Brock Purdy is going to have to live with. The reason he was Mr. Irrelevant is because he's not all that physically impressive, right? So how many muddy pockets did we see where things got really tight for him in there and made it difficult on him? The Chiefs blitzed him and blitzed him and blitzed him again. 19 blitzes in all. It was the most he has seen all year since week 11. I think Spagnolo understood if we can pressure this guy, his physical skill set 
won't allow him to shoulder everything he needs to shoulder to succeed in those situations. I'll, I'll push back a little bit in saying that I don't think the Purdy was victimized by Spagnuolo because he's a less than player because we saw Spagnuolo do it in 2007 to Tom Brady. He could do it with four in that game. He barely blitzed. But all of these guys who are pocket passers, and I'm not oversimplifying with Purdy. He can move around a little bit. But a pocket passer, you know where he's going to be. That play like that with McDuffie, there wasn't a lot that he could have done even if he was an elusive guy. Meanwhile, my friend Stephen Govan, he sometimes tweets, and he had this to say about the overtime decision. He can't receive in overtime with the new rules. It's like a baseball team choosing to hit first and extra innings. Stupid! Nice work, Shanahan. Did they not understand the rules? Phil, <laughs> I, I mean, who knew? I mean, did you know that it was two full possessions, touchdowns, don't matter, et cetera? You knew. The rule, the rule changed. The reason why I the know baseball it an ag- now, analogy, Tom, it doesn't, it doesn't work is because this would be a baseball game that could end – in an inning and a half. And that's what Kyle Shanahan was getting at. He wanted the opportunity, if the game was still tied after two full possessions, to get the ball third and therefore be batting last if you want to try to continue on with the bad analogy. That was the reasoning against Patrick Mahomes. To me, it doesn't work because you gave him the chance to understand, okay, this is how many points I need. Now I'm going to have four downs to make sure I go and get that thing. And with a quarterback who's that talented, Tom, you can't give him that kind of info. You make him go first. I, I get what you're saying, but I do understand the in-the-vacuum logic. Sometimes your point is well taken. You have to say, this is my opponent. I have to reconfigure my logic here because of who I'm going against. But if you have the chance to just tie that team, like you don't know you're going to get a field goal and not a touchdown on your first possession. Presume a touchdown, presume a touchdown. We can end it after that. To me, it did make sense. I cannot assail him for the decision. I'll assail. All right, fine. Uh, We could talk about We'll talk about this on the Patriots Talk podcast. Meanwhile, Travis Kelsey. Really terrific. Not since Pedro Martinez whipped Don Zimmer to the ground have we been more slack-jawed at any kind of elbow abuse on a sideline or uh, out of out of play area. Uh, Travis Kelsey said, I'm going to keep it between us unless my mic up tells the world. But uh, I was just telling him how much I love him. Easy there, Trav. Easy, big fella. To me, this is multi-layered because now you have however many million, tens of million fans watching because... Taylor Swift's boyfriend is playing in the game, and then he goes and acts unhinged. That, to me, makes it so much more fascinating, in addition to the fact that in a normal normal player, his ass would have been benched. Yeah, well, you know what my reaction to that moment was? Was good on Andy Reid, because right. there might have been other coaches, Tom, that would bench him, if not for the entire game, maybe for a quarter or maybe for a series or two until he cooled down. And Andy Reid said... No, you're one of our best players, going to continue to roll you out there. He only had one catch in the first half, but he ends up making a couple of key plays late in that game, helps him win the game. Good on Andy Reid for not overreacting to that situation. But he had a right to react. And if he had overreacted, it would have been a reaction that might have held the team hostage. You're right. Okay, Patriots, meanwhile, let's talk a little Pat stuff. We are closing in on a completely fully staffed quarterback group. Excuse me, um, coaching staff. You got your Mayo, you got your Van Pelt. There's the offensive side right there on the left. Tyquan Underwood coming in with the high, high, high fade, the kid and play. Bobby Kugler, of course. Then we have new additions like Jerry Montgomery, Dante Hightower, Drew Wilkins, and Jerry Me Springer. Phil, uh, we got a full reset, and it's going to be fascinating because we'll be talking to these individuals pretty soon, but now the offseason starts. Oh, it sure does. And there are a couple of hires here that really interest me, Tom. On the offensive side, it's Scott Peters, who worked under Bill Callahan, one of the best coaches, offensive line coaches specifically, in the history of the game. I mean, he, he may be right there at a, a half a rung below Dante Skarnecki in terms of all-time offensive line coaches. He is that good. And if this guy is his protege, that's a good thing for the Patriots. Then Dante Hightower, how can you not like that hire at the linebacker level? Who better to drop into Gerard Mayo's scheme, which is Bill Belichick's scheme, which is the scheme Hightower thrived in, to teach these guys how to play off the ball. Fascinating. They want a culture change. They are getting it. Meanwhile, from the stands, coming at you right now, we uh, unveiled this poll earlier today. Did the Chiefs win the Super Bowl or did the Niners lose it? Look, my guy, Rob Snyder, Buckets, he actually did a color-coded. The Niners blew it! 67.1%. The Chiefs won it, 32.9%. I put it out there because I knew it was going to be this ridiculous an assortment of responses. First up, we got our guy, John. It's always a little of both. Agreed. But in the end, the best player in the world made more plays. Completely agree. 
Thank you, John. Tim Koska. Pat Mahomes is 12 and 12, 12, 2 as an underdog. You need an elite QB to compete with this guy. Uh, I don't know. They competed. I do push back on that, Tim. Chiefs won because Shanahan chose to take the ball in OT and dare Mahomes to beat them. So he did. Uh, Phil, it's, it's a fat. This was a great Super Bowl. I know that the product might not have been over the top. We might not have had a million memorable plays, but it was a great strategic Super Bowl. It was, no question about it. And I will push back on your pushback. Brock Purdy, you need a little bit more out of that guy. Near the top of the league in terms of every statistical category coming into this game, 6.7 yards per attempt, 60% completions. That's not what enough, Tom. They were horrible on third down. At some point, your quarterback has to make plays from the pocket in critical situations, especially Mahomes to beat Patrick Mahomes. They, they had 19 points in four quarters, Tom. you got to do more if you're going to beat Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, you got a guy who's fumbling on the two. Whatever it was. Yeah, they, they both fumbled. Both teams fumbled inside the 10. Well, Bad. we're not talking about the Bad Chiefs stuff. offense. We're talking about the Niners offense, and you're assailing it. Well, a Senior lot. assail. Meanwhile, coming up after the break, we're going to talk about the New England Patriots and the quarterback position. Oh, my God, they haven't done that yet. The Patriots have two months to fix a quarterback room that was demolished. Here's some of the free agent quarterbacks available. Cousins, Minshew, Mayfield, Brissett, Tyrod Taylor, and even Sammy Darnold. Draft prospects, you know the first three. Then you got Michael Penix, you got Bo Nix, you got J.J. McCarthy. Gonna need one! Gonna need one from both of those lists! Time now for Miceland. Watch out! Organizationally, make no mistake, from the top down, the Patriots understand that coach and quarterback are the sun and the moon for their planet. They underpin everything. Duh. Yeah, I know. But it's worth noting as people like me agitate for them to maybe take a beat on taking a quarterback, that the Patriots' vision is actually very clear. And if they see the quarterback, the very clear sense I'm getting is that they're going to go quarterback. Do they have the coach? Time's going to tell if they have that right. And it will take time. But they have no quarterback right now. So how do they actually go about this? Because they have free agency in March, and they get the draft in April, and they don't know who they're going to bring in. Here's Dan Orlovsky last week talking about that. What do you do when you're a blank slate, but you have two checkpoints, free agency and then draft? Yeah, I think if we're talking the, the veteran quarterback, I, I think you go with the, the scheme first. Like, what guy do we think can come in and play at a – give us a chance to win level in this scheme because that's obviously the goal. If we're talking young player, like a draft quarterback, you quarterback over everything. I like that, quarterback over everything. That's very tight. Free agency, though, is first. So what Mayo, Wolf, Grow, Van Pelt, and McAdoo have to determine is what kind of veteran do you want? You want a placeholder who's similar to the quarterback that you think you're going to get, like Tyrod Taylor if you have Jaden Daniels or Sam Darnold if it's Drake Bay? Do you want a guy who can maybe win some games and get you to the playoffs like Mayfield or Cousins or even Gardner Minshew? Do you even consider Mac or Zappi? This all should have been done last year, of course. It was absolute malpractice to go into the 2023 season with Mac by himself on the roster. And then you reclaim Zappi and Cunningham with a straight face and you say, yeah, here's our quarterback room. Especially when Bill was actively loathing Mac. But the hole has been dug. What's the plan for getting out of it? Phil, a very simple question. I know you pay close attention while the program is on. So, from that free agent slash draftable quarterback tiers that I had at the beginning, what would be your ideal duo? Well, let's work off of what Orlovsky told us there on Radio Row. When it comes to the veteran, you're going to want a guy who can run the new Patriots scheme. That is the old Brown scheme. Alex Van Pelt, Kevin Stefanski, the marriage there. I really like Jacoby Brissett. I think he is going to be cost effective, Tom. Not going to be able to uh, use up so much money Mm -hmm. on him that you can't pay a receiver, for instance. And then go get Jaden Daniels in the draft because I think he can run that kind of scheme. Again, the comp for Daniels that we got from Orlovsky was C.J. Stroud. And Stroud is in a similar offense in Houston. So I love that tandem because it doesn't kill you in the pocketbook and gives you a lot of upside. Yeah, that's the interesting point that you make because – when we talk about winning now, look, Gardner Minshew could sniff around the playoffs. Baker Mayfield can get you there. He got the Bucks there. I'm not saying the Patriots are a playoff team next year. And certainly Kirk Cuskins could. But your point's well taken. Jacoby Brissett is not as good as those guys. You might say, oh, he's a good Gardner Minshew. He isn't. But he's a cut above the Sam Darnolds, and he's a cut above 
Tyrod Taylor, for instance. How about this, Phil? I'm going to throw this one at you because I've been thinking a little bit today. What about a Sam Darnold, Drake May duo? I don't love it. I don't hate it. And here's why. Again, it's not going to cost you very much. Sam Darnold just, spent a, just spent a year in Kyle Shanahan's system. Similar systems. It's interesting. That whole list there, Darnold, Cousins, Mayfield, Brissett, they all have played in this system at one point or another. And then the Drake May situation, if that's how it comes to pass, if he falls to number three because Daniels goes two, mm -hmm. Tom, I'm okay with that too. I would I prefer be. Daniels? Yes, right now. But I am okay with it. Big prototypical size, can throw that ball through the conditions that he's going to see here in New England, and I think he would work in this scheme too. Phil, as Frank Curran used to say, hold the phone, Charlie. What about Mac Jones sticking around? We asked both Mike Lombardi and Dan Orlovsky about the possibility of that. Differing opinions. Should the Patriots keep Mac Jones and see what he can be in this new scheme? Yes. Now, I'm, I'm, everyone says, like, in my industry, you're not ha allowed to have biases or whatnot. I obviously believe that Mac Jones is a good player. I think he's a much better player than he's been shown. So I say yes, and, like, the, the, the counter to question, my question, what's the downside? Well, who's going to play quarterback if we move down? Who's going to play? Mac. You're not going back. You're going to lose the team if you go back with Mac. You'll lose the team. That look, that look that Lombardi gave you when Mac Jones' name came out of your mouth. Oh, my gosh. It's like that little stuffed teddy bear or monkey or whatever it was that in the GIF. Anyway, uh, I'm wasting time. Phil, um, it can't happen. You know, it's, they're making the decision fairly soon. Do you think that Mac will make it into May on the Patriots roster? I do not. I, I think maybe on draft weekend you could see a move. Maybe there's a team that hoped – to draft a number two, and they see Mac Jones sitting there, and they say, well, instead of drafting a guy in the fifth, why don't we use our fifth on Mac Jones? Because he might be able to succeed in this mm -hmm. game. Remember when Kyle Shanahan wanted to draft him at three overall, Tom? There may be teams that still view him in that light, despite what's happened the last couple of years. I don't see him back. I don't know if he wants to be back here, Tom, quite frankly, next know. year. I mean, it's too much chaos, really is. Uh, check out the latest Patriots Talk podcast for much more Super Bowl chatter and further resets of the roster. Um, you can scan the QR code on the screen or you can find it on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube. More after this. You think you might have had your fill of Mike Lombardi crossing swords, as it were, with Michael Felger and even here and on the Patriots Talk podcast, but I don't want you to miss out on some of the team-building stuff that he and I explored last week in Las Vegas, so I... I send it forth to you right now, Mike. When you, you, you fill the receiver position once the rest of your team's really good. Because if you, you have believe a, that? I believe it completely. You don't think it's inverted yet? No. I think Bill Walsh were here today do the same thing. Look at the team in the Super Bowl. Debo's a second round pick. Ayuk's a low first round pick. Right? When have they ever really spent for a receiver? They tried to spend on quarterback and didn't do it the correct way because they went from Jimmy to Trey Lance and they end up with a seventh round pick. They weren't trying to fill that spot with a receiver. I think it's inverted. You look at Miami, they didn't get jump started until they got Tyreek. No, they and got Jaylen. jump started because, well, they got Tyreek, who is the number one receiver, by the way. However, they got jump started because they had to bail out their quarterback. Because if they would have kept going down this road with Tua without Tyreek, it would have not been very good. But you almost had, and that's what I think maybe is the point. Quarterbacks now are less than Montana, less than Brady. So you've got to find a guy. Stroud is really good, and he made Collins good. I mean, they got Robert Woods, who couldn't do anything in Tennessee last year, and he played for them. You know, you've got a bunch of Tank Dell was out, outstanding for him. Dalton Schultz was a free agent for yeah. a one-year contract. I, I, think you, I think you can fix it. Look, okay. the quarterback makes everybody it's everything. I, I think the offense would have been better. I mean, was it, I mean, we got a guy wide open in the end zone against the Colts in Germany. If all we got to do is throw the ball to him, we throw it to the Colts. And, but, <laughs> you got Devontae Parker running a streak down the left sideline against, I don't know, I think it was Miami. Goes right through his hands. You got Juju against the Commanders. It bounces off his hands. They're not good enough well, the, to carry the team. Well, I don't think anybody's going to argue that with you, Tom. No, I and the me, same thing with improve, Matt, It's all but, over the joint. Can Elliott Wolf? I guess this is a question. Can Elliott Wolf? engineer this what do you know about Elliot that I like Elliot that? a lot I have great respect for his dad I like Elliot I've spent a lot of time with Elliot I think Elliot will do a really good job Elliot's a very loyal personnel man and when I use the word loyal to describe a personnel man that means he'll say what he thinks he's not going to say what people want to hear there's two kind of personnel men the first kind is the one who will say what, you, what he thinks that's a loyal one the one who says what you want to hear is the devoted one 
Okay, so there's a difference between loyalty and devotion. L Elliot will say what he thinks, whether somebody wants to listen to it, he could care less. He's convicted in his opinion, and that's what you need from a scout. What would you do at number three? Because again, goes back to the quarterback. I look at it and say, sorry, it's not us. It's not you, it's us. We're not ready for you. We're gonna no. trade down, we're gonna add picks, we're gonna have two picks going I mean, into next you, year. The quarterback's there, you gotta get the quarterback. And then once you know who the quarterback is, then we have to build a team around the quarterback. I'll tell you what, people don't realize this. Ben McAdoo's a really good quarterback evaluator. Ben McAdoo, when he was at the Giants, really loved Patrick Mahomes. I know this. And the, the Giants wanted to draft Davis Webb in that draft. So McAdoo's very good at evaluating quarterbacks. Elliott will be good at evaluating quarterbacks. I think that I don't know about Van Pelt. I don't know him. But they'll be a good read. And if there's a good one to take, you take them. Because, look, you can't find them. We're, who's going to play quarterback if we move down? Who's going to play? Mac. You're not going back. You, you're going to lose the team if you go back with Mac. You'll lose the team. Because, look, you could say it's all Bill's fault. I know. We know that. We understand it Bill was. was responsible okay. for everything. <laughs> he made every bad. It was all Bill's fault in Boston. Bill At was a disaster. Point. You know, the guy, At some point. Uh, you know, it was Bill was a disaster. He couldn't coach. Mac's got accountability. 100%. All right. And so what happens is when the players know, they know. They know. And I'm just telling you they know. I can't, I can't squabble with that. He was a terrific interview. And God, do I interrupt him a lot. Um, all right. So the offseason has begun, ladies and gentlemen. Super Bowl is in the rear view. Next thing, we got the combine coming up at the end of the month. Then we got free agency starting in mid-March. Then it's on to the draft. This is a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal offseason. You know, we spent an hour and 20 minutes with Robert Kraft the other day, myself and three other individuals, Phil Perry in included, uh, in an off-the-record, comfortable conversation. And he did go on the record for a couple of answers, but the overall feel I get from Robert Kraft and ownership is that they are plowing ahead with the plan that they have. They feel they have a vision. We'll see how that vision pans out over the next two months in particular, because it's critical. 